Let him do it. We believe in freedom. That's what we say we're fighting for. Doesn't he have the freedom to disagree? Of course he does. Whether we agree with his disagreement, that's another thing. But he has the right to disagree with the Holocaust. Right now, in Europe, if you even say something against the reality of the Holocaust, you'll be jailed. What does that say? And all of us talk about how we're so democratic and we love freedom of speech and whatnot and whatnot. But everybody's being punished for saying what's in their mind. There's a, a woman who was over the Cincinnati Reds, I believe. And she made a foolish statement, but it was what she thought. She had to suffer because it was politically incorrect. This black man who made a, a statement, what he hates. And if that's what you feel, we don't like your statement. Your statement manifests this or that. But now to punish the man for telling you what he really feels in his heart. So people then are forced to be hypocrites. Oh yes, yeah, the Holocaust did exist, of course it does. Blah, 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 blah. So if I say something incorrect, I won't go to jail. You're forcing people to be hypocritical about what they feel, and yet at the same time say freedom of speech. The problem with though with someone like President Ahmadinejad is not just that he denies the Holocaust, but he also wants to incite violence against the nation of Israel. That's why people object. Because he, like Saddam, like Bashir, Bashar al-Assad, they have never agreed that the state of Israel is legitimate to them with the Palestinian suffering. They have that right to disagree. They have that right to seek Palestinian rights and justice for the Palestinian people. They, he, what Ahmadinejad, from what I understand, was saying, well, look, if the Holocaust took place in Europe, maybe Europe should have divided up some territory and given it and provided a Jewish state there. Most of the Europeans that came out of Europe, they never lived in the Middle East. They're not the Sephardim. They're not the Middle Eastern Jew. They have no connection to that land except through their biblical interpretation of scripture. So, so to remove Palestinians and make them vagabonds in the earth, to do that, if if, if, if Ahmadinejad does not agree with that, if Bashar al-Assad does not agree with that, if Saddam Hussein does not agree with that, and the protection of Israel is the cornerstone of America's foreign policy, then that puts America, Israel, some European countries right after Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And that's the politics of the situation. So we're looking at Ahmadinejad from this house that is so pro-Israeli, to the hurt of America. I know that Israel is the friend of America. There's nothing wrong with having friendship. That friendship has existed since 1948. But when your friend does things that may not do good for you and for them, the good friend will stand up and say, no, we shouldn't do that. And America has great leverage with Israel. But if you don't use that leverage to bring about some form of justice in that area, then the area is going to explode. And that's what's happening right now. So some of the people have said to President Bush, look, man, you got to get back on the peace uh, thing with the Palestinians and the Israelis. That debacle that took place in Lebanon, that was a travesty. And America let it go on and let the infrastructure of Lebanon be almost completely destroyed. Over what? You took some hostages. Hostages are still not back in Israel, but they're alive. And I'm sure they're being well treated. But to give Israel a chance to degrade Hezbollah, America just folded her hands and let it happen. That's not being a friend to Israel. That's not protecting America's position in the world.
And these politicians that allowed this, they are not the friends of America, and ultimately, they will be set down. We're running to a close. I know you have to leave. I want to ask you a couple of questions about yourself. You have a, you've had cancer, which normally is a terminal illness. You're not going to live forever. <laughs> what are your reflections on where you've come and where we are today? Certainly, I'm very aware of my m mortality. And I'm, I'm very aware that I have fewer years in front of me than behind me. I'm, I'm deeply concerned that the ideas of my teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, are inculcated in generations that come behind me. The Quran asked the question, were you there when death visited Jacob? Of course, we weren't there, but Allah was, so he revealed in the Quran. And Jacob called all his sons, and he asked them, what will you serve after me? And they said, we will serve the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when he knew that his children would serve the God that he served and live the life that he lived and do the works that he did, he closed his eyes and went to sleep in death. I would hope that the younger generation would study the works of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Study the Quran, study the Bible. But I gave a bibliography of several books because it was Black History Month. And our children are woefully lacking in the knowledge of what we have gone through to bring us to this day and time. And so I want our people to be imbued with knowledge and I want those who come after me to take the mantle that God has blessed me to wear from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and continue his work until all of our people are raised from a dead level, raised from a savage state into highly civilized behavior where we will be accepted and respected among all the civilized nations of the earth. Any regrets? Do you have any regrets? No. Are you sorry for anything you've said or done? No. Do you want to apologize to any of the groups that may have felt offended by you? No. No. I said to some of the groups that have, quote unquote, been offended by my words, come, let's sit down and reason together. Show me where what I said was wrong. I can correct the manner of my delivery that I would regret. But the words, if they're true, I would be a hypocrite to back down on the truth that I spoke. But I welcome dialogue. Come, let's sit down. You don't like this, you don't like that. Tell me what you don't like and defend it with truth. Then I will go before the world where I made the error and apologize. I'm not a proud man. If I've offended you and you show me where I'm wrong, which is your duty, then I will acknowledge it if I believe it and repent of it and go before the world and say, I'm in error, please forgive me. Let's see if anyone does that. Just a final question. Can your organization, can the Nation of Islam survive without a charismatic leader like yourself? Charisma has its place. 
movements are begun by persons who have charisma, of course, and truth. Jesus was a magnetic and charismatic figure. So was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them. Moses was too, even though Moses had an impediment of speech, he had Aaron by his side uh, to deliver his message, which didn't take anything away from the wisdom of God's choice of Moses. But after the charismatic person is gone, there has to be system. You don't know who the leader is in the Mormon church, but it continues to grow. The Book of Mormon is a big book that people all over the world are reading along with the Bible. They have a group. They're never on television. Nobody's seeking an interview with the Mormons, but they got money and they got juice. And Mitt Romney is not afraid to say, I'm a Mormon. So I'm looking for the day when we don't have to follow charisma because that's short lived. The principles that undergird charisma is more important than charisma. So the young people that are coming behind me, they don't have to be charismatic, although many of them are very, very, very charismatic, fiery and beautiful. But the main thing I'm interested in is not oratory. I'm interested in character, that your word is your bond and that you have integrity and that when you say something, you mean what you say and you say what you mean, that you're not duplicitous or hypocritical. And that's one thing that people can say, Farrakhan, whether we agree with him or not, whether we like him or not, he says what he says. I don't agree with him, but he's consistent. Either consistently right or consistently in error. But most people believe I'm consistently right. And I believe that the world will come to see that Farrakhan is not somebody that you can easily dismiss. And that's why on the stage I show generations standing behind me. Because this teaching is going down into the generations now. We need to get into high schools and grammar schools where the problems are. When we go into high schools and grammar schools there, and they're raising sand. When we speak to them, they come almost to attention. It's not that there's something wrong with our children. The methodology and the psychology of teaching has outlived its usefulness. And if you don't have the correct methodology and psychology to reach these children, the rappers do. So they can sit down and quote any rap that comes up and then miss their lessons. So there's something that the rappers have that teachers need to get. And there's something that young people have working with these computers and these games to watch these children is to say, look at how quick their minds are. And then they go to school with a slow teacher. You've come a long way yourself because you were a Calypso singer in the day. Yes. You remember that? Oh, of course. I can't forget that. I just recorded The Sparrow, who is one of the greatest Calypsonians, and uh, I'm doing a musical album. I know you asked, you wanted me to play the violin. But since the operation, something has happened with my nerves. And it's going to take a little time for my fingers to get stronger so I can play again. But I haven't played in four months. So I wouldn't bring my violin out to play. And I know it was in Jet Magazine that I played, but I didn't play. I just held the violin up and took a picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Nightline.